Our lives are powered by electricity. And as the world moves forward, we're only ever going to need more. And this makes the UK's aims of becoming net zero even more challenging. So how does all this energy get to our homes and businesses to help power our lives? Where does it come from? And what's being changed to make sure our energy supply is cleaner and greener? I'm James, and I'm on a journey with National Grid to find out just how our electricity transmission system works. From all the way out here by the sea to here in our sockets. So come and join me as I venture behind the grid. The UK's electricity grid transports electricity all around the country, from where it's generated to where it's needed. But before we can make our total store charge our phones, we need to convert that high voltage electricity we find in the overhead lines and underground cables into a more manageable voltage. So I find myself here at one of the National Grid contact centres, where I'm going to meet some people who can tell me a bit more. Contextualises for us, where are we standing right now? Yeah, so you're in our contact centre, our Pegasus contact centre. It's one of two contact centres we have uh, in National Grid electricity distribution. So we're responsible for all the inbound and outbound communication to our customers related to power cuts, new connections, general inquiries, generally anything you can think of related to the electricity network. Something's gone wrong, if people need help, exactly. they're ringing up and your lovely staff are taking care exactly. of Exactly, so it's 24-7, 365 days a year. I'm going to chat with Philippa Slater, the Director of Asset Management and Operational Support. Now, she's responsible for the performance and integrity of the distribution network. She supports the fleet that carry out the day-to-day -day activities of the distribution network. Let's go chat with her. Philippa, lovely to see you. Lovely to meet you. Thank you for having me. Can you just tell us a bit about your role here at National Grid? Yes, so I'm the Director of Asset Management and Operation Support at National Grid Electricity Distribution. So I look after the network, um, ensure from a performance, availability, reliability perspective, it is doing what it needs to do for our customers. And then the other key part of my department is Operation Support, which is effectively ensuring that our field force have access to all of the transportation fleet and inventory stores, um, availability of kind of effectively things that allow them to do their job day to day. Yeah. So we are very literally a support kind of organisation from that perspective. Amazing. And what electricity distribution, I mean, we sort of, we don't necessarily think about that as the obvious part of this organisation, but what, what does it actually mean? What are you doing? So distribution, we actually connect the customers onto the grid. Transmission, we'll take it through to um, still a very high voltage, but effectively bring in from the big generating um, capabilities, whether that be offshore, onshore. Distribution very much actually gets that to a safe voltage that can actually enter your home. So when you plug in your hairdryer, it's actually coming through the distribution network. Talking of connection points, how, I know you don't probably tell me how many people, but how many of those connection points do you sort of look after? So National Grid Electricity Distribution is formed of four license areas, which is the South West, South Wales, West Midlands and East Midlands. And across those four license areas, we have 8 million connections, oh which could be up to about 25 million customers. Do you, I mean, that is a huge number. Do you, how does that make you feel? Do you, is it like a big responsibility? Is it something you're very aware of every time you sort of come into work and go, gosh, that's... <laughs> um, I think we're very fortunate in that actually we have a very reliable network. The way that both the transmission and distribution network has developed over the years within the UK actually gives us a very sound base for moving on with. So um, I very much do feel though that I'm a custodian of the network. When we think about the amount of time that we design our assets for, they will be here long after I am gone. So actually my job is to ensure that we look after it to the best of our abilities and ensure that it's fit for purpose for future generations. Hello. Hello. Do you mind if I come and join you while you're at work? No, that's absolutely <laughs> I'm fine. I'm James. I'm Shelley, pleased nice to, to meet, meet you. you. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. This looks exciting. What's going on here? Right, OK. So we are first port of call for customers that call in uh, when they have no supply at the property or at the business. Hey! Hello! How are you doing? I'm James. Good, thank you. How are you? Very well. You're Eva? Yes, I'm yes so, I am. I'm so excited to be here. Hi. Thank you for having us right, today. No first things first, 
Tell us what you do, what's your kind of official title? So I am a uh, network planner. Um, I manage anything from low voltage networks to high voltage networks. Um, my job is consisting of so many elements. It's anything from um, single storey connections, domestic properties, small industrial units, all the way up to high voltage diversions and stuff like that. Is that something that happens often? How often are sort of these problems arising that you're having to sort of respond to? Yeah, we get a lot of requests for diversions. So if they're building a new um, domestic development or a new industrial unit, things are in the way a lot more than you would think. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of stuff in the ground. And they've got to be moved. Yeah, they've got to be moved. <laughs> but you do that without compromising power, right? So you're yes. able to keep that going. And exactly. So we'll run all our voltage checks, um, our impedance checks, and you'll see if it's still OK to move it. Then we'll quote it, plan it, and then it will go to a construction team. How important that this all runs smoothly, the ED stuff, is it to the sort of wider network? Because it maybe slightly goes under the radar what you do, but actually it's such an important yeah. part of the business, isn't it? Yeah, before I started here, I had no idea that any <laughs> of this happened. I mean, it's a completely sort of behind the scenes job at times. And yeah. then at the other points, you're a customer facing role. You'll have the initial calls come into us in the contact centre. We work really, really closely with our dispatch colleagues, so they're responsible for creating incidents, dispatching field teams. We've got the control room through there as well, looking at the high voltage network, so they're responsible. If we have a trip on the high voltage network, they will look to restore supplies as quickly as they can through remote switching. But yeah, it really does bring home how everyone is, is involved. So we're, we're the link between, effectively, between the customer, the field teams, the control rooms, the dispatch teams. So we're that kind of central link and that, you know, we're, there, we're there to provide that information for customers. How many times a day does, do you have to ring? Does, do people um, call through it? The calls that come through? Yeah. Um, it depends. Um, on a weekday, uh, general opening hours, 30 to 40. A day? Calls you take, wow. yeah, a day. Because we're obviously using more and more electricity with you know, EVs, we've got EV heat pumps and yeah. stuff like that. Are you noticing calls kind of, and more and more calls coming in as we use more stuff? Yes, yeah. definitely. Every call is different, every single call. And the fact that if you can get somebody back on supply within a couple of minutes and they're really, really happy, um, yeah, it's a <laughs> tip. It makes you smile. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's um, like a priority service registered customer. Vulnerable people, elderly yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, people that use uh, medical equipment at home, breathing apparatus, yeah. apnea monitors, things like that. Any, you know, uh, pensionable age. Is it such an important part of our lives, that, you know, electricity? And for some people, it is literally life or death. Yes. And when they call yeah. you, they you're the person they want to tell them it's going to be all right and yeah. you can get it sorted. Yeah, we've got to yeah, keep calm, reassure them. Customers have, have a choice nowadays. What's your preferred method of contact? Is it by text? Is it is it digital channels? Is it by a phone call? But yeah, we really understand the importance, particularly when it's something like a power cut, particularly for our vulnerable customers. I mean, you can imagine vulnerable customers, they, they can find a power cut really challenging. So to have someone on the end of the phone, you know, a friendly voice, yeah. to reassure them, to be able to provide up to the minute advice on what's going on with that power cut. That, that's really, really a key part of what we do, and we, we see that as being really important. I know you can't give me an exact number in terms of how quickly you can turn stuff around, but it, when people call in with a problem, is, is it remedy kind of same day? Have you got like a, a goal for that yeah, sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah, of course. The key is to get customers back on as quickly as we can. Um, we answer the phone as quickly as we can. We, we have a, a, a four and a half second speed of answer. So if you ring four us, you're coming second. pretty much straight. Yeah, exactly. Wow. You're coming straight through to an advisor. And that's something customers love. They often say, I can't believe you answered the phone so quickly. <laughs> What's the weirdest call you've ever had, or the most bizarre thing, or the thing you thought, what? Just lately, we have been getting a lot of calls to do with um, affecting the fish tanks. There's a lot of customers with fish tanks that the supply goes off, <laughs> and they are literally like, how am I going to get the oxygen to my fish? They're not worried about their um, cooking or their anything else. No, the fish are in trouble. The fish, tank, the fish are in trouble. We often get kids ringing up with kick footballs into substations. We don't want them climbing into the... Uh, <laughs> Really? Yeah, things like that. But again, it's just it just varies really. We get kites in lines. All sorts. Um, yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks for calling National Grid. You through to Kev? How can I help you? So how long has your power been off? People are ringing up to say they've got no supply, um, and that will be a case of trying to diagnose over the phone. Can we get them back on via trip switches? Do we need to send an engineer to the premises? Do we need to send an engineer to the substation to get people back on? With the transition to net zero, the focus is on electrification. Yeah. Electric cars, heat pumps. So the LCT, which is the low carbon technology. The, the, it's, the growth of that is phenomenal. So we, what we're starting to see is a difference in the types of calls we're receiving. We're getting a lot more demand for those kind of connections. How important is our transition towards net zero, Philippa? Absolutely essential. Um, I think everybody will sit here and say that they can feel the effects of climate change and the impact that we're having uh, with our day-to-day -day lives on the planet. So absolutely. Um, the speed of the transition, I think, is, is equally important, and I think that's where 
the UK stand ahead of other countries with the commitments that they have made and what they have signed up to deliver. We need to ensure that the grid is ready to take renewable energy into it. There's a lot of infrastructure upgrade required to make sure that the grid is capable, both at a distribution and a transmission level. Yes, absolutely, the transition is going to happen and there needs to be a little bit of thinking outside the box and maybe some interim thinking and some interim solutions to maybe get us partway there yeah. to then allow um, other things to catch up. I've just got an electric car, so, hey. <laughs> so uh, now I've got an EV charger at home. Great. Um, I process a lot of solar applications, so I think by 2028 we're looking at 1.5 million EV chargers applications coming in. Just in this region? Just in this region, Wow. Yeah. And I think it's about 500,000 heat pump applications. So for net zero, you know, we're trying so hard to get it. And customers really want to contribute, whether yeah. that's a little thing like a a domestic property or whether it's an industrial unit where they can have loads of solar, loads of EV chargers, stuff like that. I'm already <laughs> seeing exciting maps, Eva. <laughs> it is very exciting. It's very exciting. You have not disappointed. <laughs> Whoa. So what is all this? Yeah, so I've just been looking at this one actually. Um, we've got a mix at the moment of high voltage network and low voltage networks. Anything that's red mm. is high voltage, so 11,000 volts. And anything that's blue is 400 volts. Um, we can see both of these individually as well, so this is a combination on what is actually in the ground. So um, you get a good idea of how much cable is there. There's so much. Mm. And this is, this is like a residential area, right? This yep. is people's homes. Yeah. And of course you've got other utilities in the ground as well, so it's, the paths are quite full. So what are you, when you're sat here at your desk looking at this, what are you looking for? What sort of things happen kind of day to day for you? Um, so firstly, I'd come in in the morning. And if we've had new inquiries the day before, two days before, you have to contact the customer, um, basically to say that you've received it, and you're going to check the network, check the uh, inquiry over, see if you've got all the required information. So would that be, for example, if I wanted to have an electric car socket at home, I would yeah. put the request into yourself, you would then come on this lovely map and say kind of yay or nay? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So if someone calls in with a fault and you decide you've got to send someone out, how, how does that process work? We will take the call, we will create the incident, we will then pass it out to a field team to go in and, and have a look what's going on. That will happen, you know, normally within the hour. Um, wow. you know, we, we have targets to restore customers. There's an obligation to get people back on as quick as we can through the regulator. Um, you know, but also there's a moral obligation. People don't, you know, people need electricity at the end of the day. We, you know, you I need to work, the, the, you know, more people working from home, yeah. charging their cars. We, we're so reliant on stuff now that what happens in this room has never been more important, has no, it? Absolutely not, no. From our chat, the thing that excited me most was dispatching. I want to dispatch some stuff. Let's get you dispatched some let's stuff. Some, let's do that. <laughs> uh, we're in the right place? We are indeed. I'll introduce my colleague Jamie, he's the dispatch team manager. Jamie. Nice, nice to meet you. Me. I'm James. James, nice to meet you. Thank I'm you. Jamie. Thank you, sir. All Good to best. chat. Thank see you, you soon. Great to see you. In your capable hands. So right. dispatching, talk to me Jamie about what you do, how do you kind of fit into this sure. national grid picture? Yeah, so from a dispatch point of view, we're responsible for the full end-to-end -end incident management. So we take a call from an advisor, the dispatchers will analyse that call, look at the information, look if there's any faults going on in the area. We're looking at things like uh, network diagrams to help us diagnose what type of fault it is. That will then allow us to send the right resource to site and get the best resolution for the customer. Okay. Throughout that incident life then, the dispatcher is responsible for the communication with our field teams, making that information available on our incident management system, and therefore we've got valuable information to give to our customers via our advisors or via our digital platforms over the website on our application that we have on, on Apple and Android devices. How often do you need to actually send physically a team out or actually dispatch someone to a property or to a line? Is that quite common? In the Midlands, for example, we're, we're handling around 300 incidents a day. Wow. So that varies from defects that a meter operator might have gone out on site and found and we have to go out and do a small repair to smaller low voltage faults, 10, 30, 40 customers and then we've got the high voltage network so <laughs> you know we might be in the thousands there so it all varies from incident to incident. So you've obviously got the teams here in the office sure. and the very exciting looking maps I've seen but you've also got the teams out on the road Absolutely. who are the ones physically going to site. Absolutely. How many of them are there and what's their kind of role? So there's roughly around three and a half to four thousand field operatives. Oh it's a lot. Yeah. Distribution wise we're focused on delivery of the electricity to a customer's house. Yep. So our engineers are skilled differently, trained differently and have different levels of authorization. So I'd love to see how this actually works. Sure. Can, we, can we go and have a chat with your colleagues? Yeah, sure. Hey, how are yeah. you doing? This is Caroline. I'm James. Nice to meet you. Okay. You're not taking the calls, but you're then no. deciding what to do with the calls. Yeah. And what, you've got some incredible maps. I feel I like I'm on a Starfleet 
what are all these showing? So this is where we identify the appropriate person to send to the right job. And we use what we call our low voltage diagram, which help identify if it's underground, That's overhead, etc. Yeah. So is that, what's that blue one? Various different colours indicate different types of cables. On this one, this is actually just a normal road. Oh, wow. These are more the information, the white, and then the pole numbers indicate where the location is and where we would send an engineer. So is that, does that triangle mean something's happened? Yeah. And if I hover over that, it should actually tell us the details. We've sent somebody out there, oh, and they, because I can identify that's overhead, and the team would be able to identify that, they've actually sent some linesmen out there to rectify the line down and get the quick restoration. This one keeps flashing at me. What's happening here? What we've actually had happen here is a high voltage fuse that's blown, oh, and, oh, it, and it's yeah. blown as a result of that cable being grounded. So we've got field oh. operatives on site now that are looking to get that conductor back up in the air and put the fuses back in and restore supplies. I feel like I'm in the emergency services, you know, when you watch like 24 oh, hours. It is like that. It, it, does it feel yeah, like that? It does sometimes. I, I do feel we're a 999. Yeah, it, it feel... particularly in storms. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great day to be in. People are so reliant on us now. <laughs> mm. You know, there's so many people that are reliant on electricity. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to hand you over now to my very capable colleagues from the control room. This is Emma and this is Graham. Emma, nice to meet you. I'm James. Nice to meet you. Graham, thank Hi, you. Jamie, Hi. thank you, mate, for your help. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers. So this is the kind of bit I don't tell Jamie, but I was quite excited about meeting you guys because <laughs> we've kind of come full circle almost. So you, you guys work in the control room, yeah. which to me sounds incredibly exciting. What are you controlling? So essentially the high voltage networks. We control that interaction between the, the distribution network at 132kV one, one, and the transmission side. In my head, you guys are a bit more like air traffic control. It's like chess. You're yeah. playing a big sort of game of... Mm. Electricity manager, 2024. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I guess you never quite know what you're walking into. It's <laughs> yes. always quite dynamic. So some days you'll have a fairly steady day. You know, there's planned jobs, but there's nothing too dramatic. But other days you just don't know if there's bad weather or something. Am I right in saying it's so secret in there that I can't even go in? <laughs> That's what, is that true? <laughs> You're laughing like <laughs> coming in. Secret handshakes. To yeah. Get in there. <laughs> it feels like James Bond, you know. So the... uh, it's just it's secure. Yeah. It's so secure. Uh, obviously, because you can control stuff from our computers, you just don't want someone wandering in and going, oh, I'll start some, clicking on things. Some more on in a black <laughs> yeah. outfit. Yeah, pressing buttons. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the, the kind of wackier, stranger things that you've seen, kind of causing outages and having to reroute? Uh, I suppose. Will be para for me parachutist in the line on the 11 kV. Um, into the line. Into the line, mm -hmm. hanging in the line. Uh, unfortunately, we had a call that came in uh, telling us about it, so we knew where to send people so we could get it uh, all, all safe, isolated, aft up, and mm -hmm. so we could get them out. So now, having spoken to the experts, it's my turn. I am going to attempt a national grid training call to see how hard this really is with uh, 25 minutes of experience. Wish me luck. It's actually ringing. Okay. Hello, National Grids. It's James speaking. How, how are you? I'm losing hundreds of what? Pounds? Oh, a re oh, restaurant. What kind, of, what kind of food do you sell? Is it nice? Can I get... No, OK, right. Um, OK, watch. So I think we should see if there's a problem with the area. Much. I'm now heading to Bristol to find out about the other half of the operation and to meet some of the people who go out on site to fix the faults and keep the distribution system running smoothly. Uh, you must be Steve. I am, James. Hi, James, good to see you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having us. It's such a beautiful day. Let's go and take a seat. Yeah, I'll follow you. Let's... So see, we've got a sort of summer-ish day. The sun has come out for you. We are in our Bristol depot, so it's head office for National Grid electricity distribution. Bit of an anomaly where we have uh, an office environment as well as an operational site. So we have substations on site as well as the corporate side of the business with those other functions. Uh, my teams look after the maintenance, the repair and, and generally keeping the lights on. Um, providing customers with the, the needs of their everyday requirements um, and facilitating a network that people can connect to it 
any given time. Oh, that's... Hiya, James. Good nice to meet you. Mate. Nice to meet you. Look at this. Couldn't do a national grid film and not talk about pylons, could we? Yeah, they are our biggest way of uh, transmitting and distribution electricity, you know, across our company. So this one in particular, what's that doing and what happens here? So that pylon transmits and distributes our energy from a grid supply point all the way to our bulk supply point here at 132,000 volts. Um, and then it is dropped down to our gantries where it's brought into our switches where we control where it goes and then goes into a transformer which steps it down from 132,000 volts into 33,000 volts. That sounds like quite a big step down. <laughs> yes, it is, yeah. How does it, is that quite a long process or is it kind of almost instantaneous? Uh, it's, it's a process that is continuous. It's, it's just, it just keeps flowing as the energy is flowing until you switch it off. And why is it important to reduce the voltage? What does that mean? Well, the reason why we transmit stuff at higher voltages is to reduce the losses, which are coincidentally with the current. Okay. So that's why we always transmit voltages over long distance with higher voltages over long distance. Amazing. And then once it comes down into here and it's reducing voltage, what happens next? Well, we take it from here. This is, as I said, this is a bulk supply point and then distributed to our primary substations across the network in different areas. Wow into where then from there we will end up going to another distribution uh, substations and that's where we again step it down into customers homes. How many customers roughly do you sort of serve in this particular region? In this region of Bristol there's about 310,000 customers. So you're sending people out to fix problems, to attend to you know, things that go wrong as well, that's part of what you do here isn't it? Definitely, it's a, a big part of what we do, reacting to those faults that we don't know when they're going to happen, if they're going to happen, um, yet anyway. <laughs> How often do they happen? Are you sort of sending people out every single day? Daily responding to yeah. emergencies, power cuts or general inquiries. Yeah. Um, but also the other side of the business that isn't reactive, mm. you know, planned works with customer connections to facilitate, you know, our customers needs. Obviously we're using more electricity than we ever really have. Yes. Are you sort of seeing that happening in your day-to-day -day job, more sort of things to do I guess? Yes, we are getting more inquiries, more customer connections at a higher level of voltages and some parts of our networks need to be reinforced now because of electric cars, yes. people are having heat pumps and all these new fun things we're getting to meet net zero, yeah, definitely. And so part of your job is, is adapting and responding to the, the way that our lives are changing, I suppose? Yes, yes, definitely. We will look into certain areas of the where there's commercial sites or domestic sites that need to be uplifted and reinforced because of the new stuff going in. We often internally say to ourselves that people only realise how important electric is when it's not there. Yeah. So that that <laughs> facility of um, making sure an electricity supply is, is as stable as it can be is vital to what we do. And in, in terms of net zero, one of the things I'm really excited about, you know, from a climate perspective and also from a national grid perspective, is that transition to net zero. Is that a big part of your sort of because you're you're sort of the boss here. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's a big part of what you do now. Huge. A huge part, huge investment going into um, achieving net zero, not just locally for customers locally, but for the nation, oh, you know, the world. This is yeah. a worldwide big project. And so, you know, massive in what we do. And do you enjoy those kind of challenges that, you know, that, yeah. that transition? Yeah, we do. And, and the staff get a real sense of pride for working for a business that, that has that, that challenge ahead of it. This is incredible, isn't it? Well, this is a control room where we control open the breakers locally on site. Okay. It also has protection relays on it. These are really old relays from the 50s and 60s. These are called electromechanical relays. And so when you say breakers, what, what are they actually doing? So all that power is coming, it's being stepped down, it then comes through here. Well, all the power is being stepped down. It goes through cables yeah. and then goes into our breakers on the other side of this room. But these guys and girls control the circuit breakers. So now we're going to see the circuit breakers. Yes. Let's go. Whoa. Look at this room. So this is... This is our circuit breakers where, from where we've seen outside, the cables come across and they go into the back of these circuit breakers. And these, to me, look quite old. Yes. This, <laughs> are they? Yes, they are. This switch gear is quite old. It's um, from the 50s. It is the last of its type that's been installed in this country. There's no more of this, and we are actually in the process of removing this. We've started a project that will conclude 
um, next year to remove this and install a much uh, newer gear for so it. They're being kind of upgraded a little bit. Yes. And so, I mean, it's a bit like a fossil, isn't it? It's a sort of you know, a bit of history, really. Yes, there is a bit of history. You this look is... quite proud. I like yes. Yeah, yeah, you look. Because this is a history of Bristol. This is um, one of the first um, switch gears to be in Bristol, you know? That's pretty cool. Yeah. And then, so let's get back to some of my GCSE physics. What do circuit breakers actually do? What is their role in this system? So, circuit breakers are a way for us to either control our system, so opening and closing them by isolating certain parts of the system. Or if there's a fault, you want to limit the amount of energy going into a fault and the damage the energy will cause. And using the protection relays which you've seen, these will open these circuit breakers. Okay, so we've seen pylons, we've seen the step down, we've seen the role of circuit breakers. Shall we go and see why these are so important and find out what happens next? Yes, definitely. We will go to a primary transformer next and we will have a look at that. Let's find a primary transformer. If I was a primary transformer, where would I be? And how long have you been at National Grid for? 27 years now. Wow. Yeah. The, the thing that always strikes me is that people tend to stay at National Grid for a genuinely really long time. Is that just, do you just love it? What's the secret? I think the secret is it's a great place to work. You know, I've made some great friends. I've come from through the grassroots of an apprentice up to my head of operations role now. Um, but it, it's, it's a great place to work in a sector that is, you know, it's not diminishing, it's increasing. Yeah. So if someone wanted to get to where you are and work in this world, is that an easy thing to do? Are there opportunities at National Grid to kind of find a way in? There, there, there's lots of opportunities. Um, and I say to many people that um, if you want it, you, you can achieve it. Yes, you need motivation. Yes, you need drive. Yes, you need inspiration, aspiration. But you can be what you want to be. It's a company that will allow you to thrive. In we go, Moaz. This is the primary transformer. Is that yes, right? Yes. This I'm is. I'm learning. Yes, you are. This is a <laughs> primary transformer. Um, on this side here, we have two of them together. So, as we've seen, we've got the breakers. Yeah. The 33 kV cables would come in to something we call the cable box. Cable box. This is a cable box where those cables come from under the ground. Oh yes. Into these cable trays. Into this cable box here. This is a pretty old transformer that is getting removed in the next six months. So from the 11 kV output of this transformer, it goes into these red cables, which end up going into our distribution subs, where it again is step down from 11 kV to 415 volts, and that's yes when you zap it again. That's when I can press my lights on, <laughs> yes. finally. So just to recap, when it comes in from the pylon, it's yeah. at how many? 132,000. And then it, this is nearly the final step at? This is the second final step. Second final. Because it goes from 132 to 33, then from 33 to 11, so that's where we are now. And then there's another stage where it goes from 11 to 415 or 230. I mean, that is incredible. I can't believe how much stuff has to happen for it to get to where it needs to get to. It's yes, still... it's quite an extensive process and it needs to be maintained constantly to keep the power on for everyone. And how, how long in like minutes does it all take to happen? Electric flow is instantaneous. As soon as you switch on the light, it just comes on straight away, isn't it? You can't even, it's a, less than a blink of an eye. And that's how long it takes for the power to flow. And all that stuff has happened? Con continuously, just like a river flowing. Electricity in rivers, same thing. Yes. <laughs> just don't mix them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, we're sort of in your lair, aren't we? This we is are your. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's where you come to work every single day. Yeah, that's right. You're kind of in charge of looking after the National Grid fleet, essentially, aren't you? That's Making right. Sure that it gets that's out correct. there. And yeah, that's it. Needs. If there's any faults, obviously they come and let us know so that we can repair it and make sure they're out servicing the grid. So we're all kind of working for the same thing of keeping the lights on. But keeping the lights on. To for keep the, the lights customers. on, you've got to make sure the cars' lights are that's on. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's a good analogy. Yeah, and, definitely. And how many vehicles are we talking about in the, in the whole fleet? Do you know. So in the whole fleet, we've got around about sort of six thousand vehicles, something like that. We've seen a lot of vehicles come through. A lot of vehicles change, be different models and vehicles as they've come through. Now we've got the EVs yeah, as well. A few of those through. So yeah, there's a different. Obviously, the market and industry always changes. Yeah. So it's just keeping up with that. Well, quite helpfully, we've sort of got a bit of a history lesson behind us because we've sort of got yeah. the original Defender. We've got petrol, diesel, yeah, yeah, and now yeah. we've got these and the EV. beautiful yeah. EVs. So That's it. I'm guessing we're seeing more and more EVs on the on the grid. Are we? we will do. We will do as the EVs start to meet our specification because obviously we need to make sure that the vehicles will do what we need in the field. Yeah. So obviously at the moment, 
we're running just the small vans, which is the ones that suit the nature of the work that they need, the area they can cover and stuff like that. But we will see it go into the bigger vans eventually. So yeah, yeah that's and all coming. I think I'm going to ask Adam very nicely if I can actually go out with him in one of the oh, EVs. Yeah, have, yeah. You got, have you got any tips for me? Um, First time out on the road with a national grid. They're, they're so good, to be fair. They're so easy to use, these EVs. So easy to drive, you won't have any problems. I, well, hopefully, like, in the nicest way, you don't see me again. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, something will have gone wrong. wrong. Thank yep. you, mate. Really nice to meet no you. No worries. Thank you. Cheers, James. Hi, buddy. All right. Nice to meet you. Okay. Nice today. We have to be cleaner. What we're driving in now is an electric car. Yeah. The infrastructure is getting better. It needs improving, and that's what National Grid are, are doing. This is a 11 kV to LV distribution substation. Teeny tiny substation. Yeah, so from one of them, oh, yes. 33 down to 11. In here, 11 down to 400 to 230 volts, what you get inside your house. That's what goes into my house? Yes. And that's the one that you've got back at the yard, right? Y yes. Have you seen yeah. those? Yeah. Yeah, you've seen a couple of them, yeah. Look how small it is! So this is the ring main unit. So 11 kV goes in and goes out. So it's a big ring system. And then bolted on the back is a transformer. Oh, yeah. Up there. And then here is the LV cabinet, which if I just oh, yeah, open I get this one. door. Oh, look at that. I don't think I've ever been this close. Oh, look at, oh wow. So that is basically a big fuse board, like I said. So that's kind of just a bigger version of what we might have in our homes. Yeah, yeah. So you've got your fuses that then feed out down these cables at the bottom here, go all the way around to the network, branch off into people's houses, into the factories that um, opposite yeah, us. businesses here, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, roughly how many people would get their electricity from this substation? Mm. About three to five hundred people. It's quite a lot yeah, from just customers, this. Yeah. That's a big step down from is, eleven yeah. like ten meters away. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, thirty-three that side, then eleven, then two thirty or four hundred volts. And that all kicks off from back at the yards where yeah. it's coming off the pylon. So yeah, when you on the pylon that you saw earlier, um electricity's flowing from there all through the fuse balls, bigger fuse balls on the thirty-three side, then the eleven side, and then down onto the two thirty volt. And this is where it goes into our homes. Yes. And that makes sure I can flip my switch. Yeah. And everyone's happy. Yeah. We've got cables that are 100 years old. When it was first used, there was a lot of load. Then we've got better with our managing load. You know, you look at your light bulbs now. We used to have 100 watt light bulbs. Now they're down to like 5 watts, 6 watts. But now because everybody's relying on electricity more and more, the load's creeping up again. So it all comes down to this. Yeah, so very similar to what you saw earlier with um, the underground cables. This is the overhead network. So this is 230 volts or 400 volts going um, from the little distribution substation we saw to the houses out there. As you can see, the cables are going off across into the properties there physically overhead. And rural, you'll see this a lot more, whereas urban, you'll see them underground, underground. a lot more. Yeah. What, why is that? Just more space out there? More space um, and easier to... to yeah, to run to the cables and everything like that. So yeah. Well, after all that back at the yards, we've seen yeah. that huge massive pylon. We've seen all those step downs. What's the mass again? Comes in at 132,000 volts. Steps down to 33,000 volts. Step down to 11,000 volts. Steps down to 400 volts, 230 volts, and then, as you can see, going across from this pole into the property there, which wow. turns your, you know, pug your kettle in, have a cup of tea <laughs> after a hard day's work. Simple as that. I'd yeah. So, there we go. A little look behind the scenes at the electricity distribution network in all its glory. And isn't it glorious? All those people that are involved, the infrastructure, the work that goes on behind the scenes at National Grid to ensure that we, you and I, have all we need at the tip of our fingers, literally at the flick of a switch. Everything today is working wonderfully well, but it's time to look ahead to the future. Can our network handle the challenges to come. We're using more electricity than we ever have. Is it fit for purpose? Is it resilient? Is it future-proof? Well, it's time to find out.